Good day there. This is Digby knocking on your door from my home here at Whale Beach and saying a special hello from our sponsor, Edgel, the family of fine foods. Right now, what shall I tell you? Do you happen to possess uh, a cuckoo? Or have you ever seen a cuckoo? Cuckoos lead bohemian lives. They fail as husbands and as wives. Therefore, they cynically disparage everyone else's marriage. Don't need travelling lately? Well, we might take you on a little imaginary trip next time we meet. To somewhere glamorous, perhaps. Would you like to get away from it all? I expect you would. And uh, if you haven't had a holiday yet this year, well, we'll imagine that you're on one next time we have our little get-together. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've had a little bit of a relax and enjoyed your cup of tea and there isn't too much work uh, in front of you today. But just to give you a little helping hand, in case there is, I'd like to give you a thought, if I may. Is life but a shadow within a dream? Are we just shadow shapes which only seem to move like phantoms o'er this mortal sphere? Or are we meant for real achievement on our journey here? Life is not a pilgrimage with neither end nor aim. We have the heart and spirit and the clear controlling brain to overcome ill fortune and spread beauty, joy and light and enter into greater things when we have won the fight. Well, there it is. Have a nice day, won't you? And I'll see you next time. Take care of yourselves. Bye. The chairman is a lady. The story of a woman's strength and a woman's weakness. Frost is the head of a vast industrial organization known as Frost Incorporated. She inherited the business from her father and after his death managed it almost single-handed. Elmer's secretary, Shirley Cooper, is also her niece. Shirley is horrified when she learns that her aunt is suffering from heart disease and may soon die. Old Elmer Frost tells the girl that she is to be her sole heiress. Shirley protests that she is unfitted for this responsibility, but her aunt brushes aside her objections and emphatically states her dislike for Shirley's father and her brother. Some days later, Shirley is at home with her father when she learns of Elmer Frost's death. Her father, Arthur Cooper, immediately assumes that he will take over the business and manage it with his son, Ian. To his surprise, Shirley announces that she will manage the business herself. Arthur Cooper stares at his daughter. Then he speaks to her, very gently. Shirley, you've had a big shock. You don't realize what you're saying. We can talk things over in the morning. I do know what I'm saying, Father. I knew Aunt Alma was going to leave everything to me. You... you knew? Yes. Well, at least you might have told me. She asked me not to. Does Ian know? Of course not. Oh, you kept your father and your brother in the dark. I had no option. You can't be serious when you say you'll manage the business yourself. I'm quite serious. But don't be absurd, Shirley. How can you manage a huge concern like Frost Incorporated? You're only a girl. Aunt Alma was only a girl when she took over the business. But you're a different type. You're shy and retiring. I can face up to my responsibilities. But, uh, it'll be Ian. I told you he was coming round tonight. You can tell him all about it. I'm going up to bed. Uh, no, wait, Shirley. You must talk this over with your brother. Yeah, I'll let him in. Hello, oh, Dad. Oh, I'll come in, Ian. Shirley? Has old Frosty been working you to death? Quiet, Ian. 
What's the matter? Shirley's just had a big shock. We both have. Oh, what's happened? Your Aunt Alma died suddenly this afternoon. Aunt Alma? Dead? And Mr. Barnes, her solicitor, has just been here. It is a shock, I must admit. Do we get her money? I suppose we do, in a way. Oh, stop it, both of you. All you can think about is money. Aunt Alma meant nothing to you. I'll admit I never got on well with her, but she was my aunt, and I suppose she remembered me in her will. She left you nothing, Ian. Nothing? How do you know? Uh, take it easy, Ian. Your Aunt Alma left everything to Shirley. What? Shirley is more or less the head of the firm now, but of course uh, we'll have to help her. Yes. Yes, I'll run the business for you, Shirley. I think Aunt Alma might have left me something. Aunt Alma did plenty for you in her lifetime, Ian. You've got a good job in one of her companies. Assistant accountant at Frost Plastics. Working for a mere pittance. I'm coming into head office. We can talk about it some other time. Tell me all the details. Have you a controlling interest in everything? I don't know all the details yet. I'm seeing Mr. Barnes in the morning. I'm going up to bed now. Uh, wait a moment, Shirley. Let her go, my boy. She's very upset. We can talk matters over between ourselves tonight, and we'll know more after she's seen the lawyer in the morning. Oh, there's just one reservation in your aunt's will, which I must tell you about. Oh, what is it? Neither your father, Arthur Cooper, nor your brother, Ian Cooper, are ever to hold executive or managerial positions in Frost Incorporated or in any of its subsidiaries. That seems very harsh. Well, I, I was in Miss Frost's confidence. And I'm afraid she didn't trust either your father or your brother. I know she disliked them, but surely I'm allowed to help them if I want to. Oh, there's nothing to prevent you from giving them money, but I trust they'll spend it wisely. Terrific responsibility. Yes, I know it is. But with that in mind, you must carry out your duties without fear or favor. Uh, oh, excuse me, Mr. Lewis. Yes, I see. Hold the line a moment, please. It's your brother, Mr. Ian Cooper, here, Shirley. He's asking to see you. Oh, I'll ask him to send him in. Do you want me to tell him about that clause in your aunt's will? Uh, no, I'll tell him. Uh, will you send Mr. Cooper at once, please? Thank you. Hello, Shirley. Morning, Mr. Barnes. Good morning. Oh, I'm a bit late. I didn't expect you in. I thought I'd better come round. I knew you'd need me. Uh, you understand, Mr. Barnes, I'll be looking after my sister's interests. No, I don't understand. Oh, but Shirley can't manage things for herself. I'll be acting for her. Now, let me know the details of my aunt's will. Uh, Ian, there are several things I have to discuss with you, but not at present. There's no time like the present. You can't be expected to understand the pitfalls of the business world like I do. You'd better tell Mr. Barnes who'll be taking orders from me. Oh, really? Uh, please, uh, leave this to me, Mr. Barnes. Ian, I want you to go now. You're telling me to go? Yes. I'll come around to your flat to see you and Diana tonight. There are several things I have to tell you. Tell me now. No, I'm very busy at present. There are lots of details Mr. Barnes has to explain to me. Now, please go. You're practically ordering me out. I don't let all this money go to your head, Shirley. Young man, your sister has a lot on her mind. If you take my advice, you'll go now. Please, Ian. I'll come and see you tonight, I promise. Oh, all right. We'll settle things then, once and for all. jungle full of big cats ready to tear you to pieces. That's how my grandfather described the glamour magazine business. When I took over that business, I was a woman alone with three ambitious men, three dangerous males in the paper jungle. My grandfather had warned me about three ambitious men, 
in the paper jungle of his publishing business that I had since inherited from him. But so far, the three men, George Harley, Russ Klein, and Al Wishart, had shown no sign of being dangerous to me. The biggest menace, and the biggest shock I'd had since taking over the business, arrived in the form of Jane Wishart, whom I'd never heard of and who burst unannounced into my office while I was conferring with Elle. Of course, it won't be any different having a woman for a boss, you said. You aren't interested in any other woman, you said. Not much, you aren't. Let's go, Jane. I'll take you take home. Take your hands off me. Do you think I don't know what's going on here? Now, see here, Miss Whoever you don't are. Don't you dare talk to me, you rotten Jane, little... stop it. And I'm not Miss anything. I'm Mrs. Mrs. Wishart. Mrs. Al Wishart. You're what? I'm sorry, Helen. It's true. This woman is my wife. Your wife? Yes, his wife. I suppose you'll tell me you didn't know he had a wife. No, as a matter of fact, I didn't. Not much you didn't, little Miss Innocence. I bet you tell that to all the wives whose husbands... Jane, will you shut up? Miss Bradshaw didn't know about... Well, about us. Nobody here does. What? I certainly didn't know that Al was married, Mrs. Wishart. But I may as well add that it wouldn't have made the slightest difference if I had. I am not remotely interested in your husband except as an employee. A valued employee. Huh, that's what you tell me. I wouldn't expect you to admit you're a, a husband stealer. Come on, Jane, let's go. Now, come on. All right, all right. You can even tear my arm off, but don't you think for one moment. Oh, poor Al. No wonder he kept her under wraps. Office wife. The story of the girl who married her boss and of the girl who took over. Harry Palmer opens the next chapter of Office Wife. As I suppose you're almost bound to have read in the papers by this, poor little Millie Moffat was run over and killed in the park on Wednesday. I was there. It shook me up, I can tell you. But it wasn't my fault. I can't be blamed if Millie went almost off her head and jumped out of my car when I told her I wouldn't marry her, can I? And anyway, it's too late to worry over the poor kid now. She's gone, and that's that. But it was lucky for me. How lucky, I can hardly realize. Millie was just about to spill the beans to Marcia and her uncle Tressa de Bendigo, but she left it too late. So, well, the best thing I can do is forget about her. And that wasn't my only close shave. I thought I had Stella Bronson on my side. But I've never been so wrong about anything. And as a result, I have to explain to Marcia how Millie Moffat happened to be with me when she was killed. I have to be careful here. I think we can manage it. I'm sorry, Harry, but I simply can't get Millie Moffat out of my head. But you scarcely knew the girl. Well, I'm not grieving. Oh, I, I know it's not very nice when people you know get run over, but... Well, Stella Bronson that night. She must have had something definite. She wanted us all together so Millie could tell us something. Stella Bronson, I tell you, Marcia, that woman will drive you crazy if you don't get her out of your mind. But then Millie was killed at just the right moment. Right moment, Marcia? What were you doing with her the day she was run over? Oh, darling, I've told you again and again... I simply drove her to the park and we stopped for a few minutes. But why? No, oh, I'm sorry if I sound suspicious, Harry, but after being diddled so completely by Jeff, I can't bear the thought of being taken in a second time. Oh, you should know me better than that, Marcia. I couldn't lie to you. And as for poor little Millie, well, when you married Jeff Pilgrim, I did see a certain amount of her. But she took it a lot more seriously than I did, and so that last Wednesday, when I tried to tell her that we were definitely finished, she flew into a terrific rage and jumped out of the car. Straight in front of the taxi cab. Well, can't you imagine how rotten I feel about the poor kid? Don't make it any worse for me, Marcia. Don't get any silly ideas. No, oh, but if only I could work out what it was Millie had to tell us. 
About you, Harry. Stella, Stella said it was about you. Now, listen, Lars. Stella Bronson's a clever girl. She knows her only hope of keeping your husband out of jail is by pinning the swindle on someone else. And who'd make a better clay pigeon than me? Oh, that's not reasonable. How could she pin it on you? I don't know. But I'm worried. Stella had something up her sleeve. Wanted to get us all together with Millie. Oh, and do you know something else? I... I wasn't going to tell you, but... When you rang my flat the other night, Stella was there too. At your place? Yes. I didn't realise till after you'd rung, but Stella was there to plant something in my desk. Oh, Harry, really? All right, ask her. She'll tell you she was there to find something. Oh, I don't know what to think, truly, I don't. Oh, shove the whole rotten business clean out of your head, darling. You'll go grey if you let it get you down properly. You do believe what I've said, don't you? I... Oh, I suppose so. Well, I wish you sounded a little more definite about it. Harry, I'm going to see Stella. Just once, for the last time. What on earth for? I'm going to ask her what she was doing in your flat. And if she said she was there to find something, well... Well, what, Marcia? I'll believe you. Never, the story of three lives that clashed under the spell of love, adapted from the world-famous novel by Margaret Kennedy. The little village of Madalena on the shores of the Aldersey was quiet again, after all the excitement of the arrest of the Marquise and the departure of Herr Hugel. At the Hotel Bonito, Sir Ivor and Lady Maclean and their daughter Fenella were busy packing and making arrangements for their return to England. Fenella wondering how soon it would be before she saw Carol Sanger again, and when she could approach her father about their engagement. At least, that was what she was thinking when she wasn't thinking of Sebastian and the rather disturbing effect he had on her. Sebastian, who had married Gemma just over a week ago in Steinach, and who now stood on the deck of the little channel steamer with Gemma and Carol beside him, watching the cliffs of Dover coming nearer. I don't know why I decided to come at all. Nothing but trouble ever happens to any of us in England. Now look, Sebastian, if you can't be more pleasant, why don't you walk around the deck a few times? That's the best suggestion you've ever made, Carol. I'll do it. What on earth's the matter with him? Don't you know? No, I don't. He's writing, composing music, working on his new ballet. Oh, so that's it. It ought to be called Ballet Written in Dejection Near Dover. Poor Sebastian. I suppose he's really impatient to get to it now that he's started. Where did he start right? In Steinick, day after we were married. He's like father. First couple of weeks he was working on a new idea, he was unbearable. Oh, I suppose he'll be better when we get to London. London. I wonder how long it will be before Penelope. Says... You are going to marry her, aren't you, Carol? Of course. I hope nothing happens to stop you. Oh, silly, what could happen? Gemma, I haven't had much chance to tell you before, but I'm terribly happy for you. I'm so glad you and Sebastian are married. Are you, Carol? Yes. Aren't you happy? Oh, I suppose I ought to be. I love Sebastian. I, I've loved him for a long time. Now he's my husband. And yet... What, Gemma? If only I could be sure he loved me. He's never really told me so. It just says he couldn't live without me. Well, that ought to satisfy you. I still can't help feeling that he doesn't realize he's actually married to me. He doesn't take it seriously. Music's the only thing Sebastian takes seriously. You know that, Gemma. Yes, I know. And you can't change him. Oh, I don't really want to. It's just that... Oh, oh I don't know. Oh, here he comes. Well, I hope he's in a better mood. Well, he looks all right. How did the walk go? The boat's too crowded to even walk in comfort. Of all the wretched, oh, horrible... We've heard all that before, Sebastian. We'll be in London soon, Sebastian, and then you can write your head off. Where are we all going to live in London? Anyone thought of that? Well, I don't know where you're going to live. With you, of course. Now, listen. When we get off at Victoria, I'm going to say goodbye. I'm going off again on my own after this. 
But, Carol, you can't do that to us. You mean we won't see you again? Oh, Carol. I think that's a bit much. After all, you brought us here. I didn't bring you here. I've come to England to get work and marry Fenella. I'll do neither if I stay with you two. But we've got no money. What are Gemma and Piccolo going to do without money? Well, we'll share out what we have left. It'll keep us for a day or two. And after that? Well, it'll be your affair. You got on all right before you met me. I don't suppose we can really expect you to keep us. Well, who's going to? For heaven's sakes, Sebastian, you can find some work to do. I've got some work to do. I've got my ballet to write. I thought you knew that. And you thought that you could live on my earnings. Well, you can't. You've got through most of my savings as it is. Get this into your head, both of you. You won't get another penny from me after we've shared up what I have now. But, Carol, this ballet, it's something I've got to write. I can't do anything until it's done. Sebastian, you've got to do what I've got to do. Earn your living and get your writing in as well. Now, don't you think I'd like to be perfectly free from my own work? Your work? Yes, my work. Do you mean that rubbish you can cock when you're feeling sentimental? Sebastian, why shouldn't he write music as well as you? Because he knows it isn't. Now, that's enough, Sebastian. I'm sick and tired of your infernal rudeness. I have a good mind Carol, to... Carol, please. He doesn't know what he's saying. He'll be sorry well, I tomorrow. don't care whether he's sorry or not. I've finished with him. Absolutely finished with him. Um, um, oh, wish they wouldn't do that. Makes me jump. Yes, it's a horrible noise. Well, you better get your things together. We're going into the harbour now. How things are over there, Sebastian? Where? Well, go over well, hurry there. Hurry up, Sebastian. There's an awful crowd. And if we don't get off quickly, we'll be waiting ages to get through the customs. Gemma, you'd better come with me. I'll help you and Piccolo through the crowds. Now, come along, Sebastian. You follow with the luggage. <laughs> Thank heavens that's all over and we're here. <laughs> we'll be at Victoria shortly. Carol. Hmm? What is it, Sebastian? You didn't really mean that, did you? About being finished with Gemma and me? I did. Oh, but Carol, you will come and see us sometime. I don't know. If I do, you'll probably get me into a lot more trouble. I like that. You were the one who got us into trouble. You ought to be grateful to us. We found your girl for you. Yes, if it hadn't been for us, you'd probably still be in Venice pining for us. Yes, 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 I know. And I, I don't really want to break with you, but I've got so much to do. I, I can't be responsible for you two and Piccolo. But you don't have to be responsible for all of us. Just lend us some money occasionally. Most definitely not. We won't want very much. Gemma will be able to get a job, won't you, Gemma? Probably. If I can get someone to look after Piccolo. I'll look after him. I've done it before. Oh, poor Piccolo. You'll probably forget to feed him. Oh, no, Carol. Sebastian's very good with Piccolo. Anyway, you can work it out for yourselves. I'm not interested. Look, we're here. Well, I'll take my things and say goodbye. Aren't you even going to tell us your address? No. If you want me, you can write to me care of the Charing Cross Post Office. Goodbye, Gemma. Goodbye, Carol. Well, Sebastian, I hope your ballet is successful. Goodbye. Carol, goodbye, wait. Goodbye, Sebastian. Well, of all the ungrateful, nasty... Oh, shut up, Sebastian. Carol's right. You've taken his money, you've treated him disgracefully, and now you expect him to help you. Someone's got to help us. We haven't a penny. I have. I've got 20 pounds. Gemma, where did you get it? Oh, that's my affair. So, you see, we don't need any of Carol's money. 20 pounds? Well, why didn't you say so before? We could have offered him something. Idiot. Never take it. Why not? We've taken his. Sebastian, don't you realize that you really hurt Carol's feelings when you called his music sentimental rot? I only spoke the truth. I think it'd be better sometimes if you didn't speak at all. Well, I do think you should have said something about having 20 pounds. Well, I thought he might guess where it came from and make me send it back. Where did it come from? Uh, Sebastian, look, we'd better get out of the train. Everyone else has gone. Gemma, where did you get that money? Oh, from Fenella. She gave it to me when she was driving me to Steinick. She knew we were hard up. Fenella? From Primavera? Oh, I wonder when I'll see her again. Come on, Sebastian, hurry. And you forget Fenella. She's Carol's girl. Anyway, you won't see her again because you don't know where she lives in England. Carol does? Oh, he won't tell you. Anyway, we don't even know where he lives now. Oh, he'll be round looking for us. Oh, no, he won't. Oh, yes, he will. What makes you so sure? Look. It's a what? Carol's watch. Sebastian, you stole it. It belonged to my father. 
I have as much right to it as he has. When he finds it's missing, he'll come after us. That's why I took it. Just to make sure we'll see him again. And Fenella. Sebastian smiled to himself rather curiously and said no more. Gemma was too busy wrapping Piccolo in a warm shawl to notice that smile, and both Carol and Fenella were miles away. But if she had noticed, she might have realized that Sebastian was to cause them all a lot more trouble before his ballet was finished. Martin's Corner. Hey, what do you think of this? The Martin boys have been found. No. Ah, oh, they have. Mr. Martin rang me just now. Isn't it wonderful? Mm. Oh, I was so worried about those boys. Do you know I was even getting out a black dress for the funeral? Oh, Mr. Slot. Well, you've got to face facts, dear, and you've got to be prepared. I'd hate to have something run up at the last minute, and I don't usually wear black. Pity you don't. Why? Well, old people always look their best in black. Mrs. Mags, are you insinuating that I'm an old woman? Well, you, you're getting on. You just have a look at yourself in the glass sometime, dear, before you start talking about other people. Anyhow, I didn't come in here to argue about age, dear. <laughs> The Lux Radio Theatre. Tonight presenting John Hewitt and Frank Waters in Kidnapped. There's nobody home. Hello there. Hey, open up properly. How do you expect me to talk through a crack like that? Do you think you can break in? The door's chained. What's your business, boy? I have a letter from Mr. Ebenezer Balfour, and I want to see him. Uh, so you want to see him, do you? Aye, Aye. I do. Well, and what's your name? Uh, they call me David Balfour. Is your father dead, then? Oh, why do you ask? Uh, he'll be dead, no doubt. Uh, that'll be what brings you rapping at my door. Well, man, I'll let you in. Uh, mind your step on that rotten floorboard. Oh, the whole house is crumbling. Come into the kitchen. I am Ebenezer Balfour, and I'm your born uncle David, man. I'm your born uncle Ebenezer. And you, of course, are David, and you're my born nephew and my brother's only boy. <laughs> Give me the letter. I'm sorry, sir, if I offended you. Stir the fire so I can read it. Well, don't stir too hard, but I don't hold with wasting fuel. If you're hungry, eat that drop of porridge. Oh, I fear it's your supper. I can do fine without it. I'll take the ale, though, but it slackens my cough. Drink water if you're thirsty. Thank you, sir. Mm. Well, no doubt you've read this interesting missive, huh? Oh, indeed not, sir. The seal was intact, as you could see. 
At least you'll have hoped something would come of it, huh? Well, I, I, I confess, sir, when my father died and our minister told me I had well-to-do kinsfolk, I, I did indeed indulge the hope that they might help me in my life. Did you, sir? But I'm no beggar. I look for no favors. I want none that's not freely no, given. No, 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 no. Don't fly up in the air at me, lad. No doubt you heard muckle about me from your father, huh? Well, I never knew, sir, until after he died that he had any brother at all. Hear me. Hear me. Nor yet to the house of Shaw's, I dare say, huh? Never so much as a word. You're lying. I am not. Then you know nothing at all concerning me and, and things? Nothing. Baby lad, I mean to do right by you. M my father said you would. No, go canny, man, go canny. Abide here a wee while, eh? Uh, and say nothing to nobody, and let me think a while uh, what's the best to do. Well, if you want to help me, there's no doubt, but I'll be glad of it and grateful. Uh, grateful you should be, that I'm an honest man, but I've just thought of the answer. Uh, uh, are you sure that your father never mentioned anything between him and me? Huh? Never. Uh, that's a fine lady, uh, for there was something. I, I promised your father once. A wee bit of silver. Money? Mm, aye, money. No, no, nothing legal, you can. Just the promise out of the goodness of my heart. What would you say now if I gave that money to you? Eh? Why, I'd thank you, sir, for such goodness. Mm. The sum I'm thinking of is, uh, uh, with interest, it has grown to be mm, just precisely, <laughs> just exactly 40 pounds. 40 pounds? Aye. You'll be no getting more or expecting aught from me again, you can. Oh, such a heap of money. Oh, I can't stand it. Well, if you feel so bad, I will not take it. But um, if I could inflict myself on you a short while more, sir, it's far from Essendine. I'm tired and the storm is bad. Of course, I want you to stay the night, Davy boy. And uh, that brings me to what's on my mind. Will you do something for me? I'm very willing to serve in any way. Will you fetch me something from the room along the passage? A, a chest, a small oak chest. I want you to go along and fetch it. Oh, I can't go without a light. I can't see my way. You, you can feel your way. I'll have no lights carried about this house. I'd set it afire. Well, how can I find it in the dark? Along the passage, open the door on your right. You'll find the chest. Oh, the floors are all crumbling. Nonsense, nonsense. They're as safe as houses. Gone you off. The door on the right, you say? Aye, the door on the right. This must be it. Aye, aye. It's so dark, I can hardly see. Aye. He's killed. He's killed. Dead. Dead, I say. Dead. No. <laughs> He's not killed. He's not dead. <laughs> Elijah. Elijah, you, you can't be. My sick heart is deceiving me. You wanted to kill me. That door opens blank on the cliff face. Only a flash of lightning saved me from plunging onto the rocks. Come now, sir. Sit up and explain yourself. <laughs> the blue file. Uh, fetch me the blue file off the table. For my heart. My poor old heart. Here it is. <laughs> my heart will kill me yet. I'll help you to your bed. Come on. Bed. Yes, yes, Davy. To bed. Yes, yes. Now, tell me why you wanted to kill me. Why do you hate me? What have I done? I'll tell you in the morning. I will. I will. As sure as death, I will. Presenting the MGM Story, Episode 2. Hello, this is Michael Hastings back with you for Episode 2 of the MGM Story, which we might subtitle, How the Screen Learned to Talk. Meanwhile, on another stage at MGM, a most ambitious project was underway. Producer Harry Rafe and director Harry Beaumont 
were making the screen's first musical, The Broadway Melody. On the set was Charles King, a favorite Broadway musical comedy star. As he was rehearsing one of his big song numbers, director Harry Beaumont was sitting biting his fingernails. Oh, this is a fine mess. Here I've got a swell singer, a swell number, and what's the poor guy got to do? Stand still in one spot looking like a dope. How can any singer put over a number looking as if he's frozen in a block of ice? Yet if he starts to move around, this song will sound like nothing on earth. Hey, Harry. Hmm? Oh, John Arnold. Hello, John. What's on your mind? Harry, I've got something I'd like to show you. I think it might solve your problems. You have? Okay, Charlie, bring it up. Take a rest. Okay, John, let's have it. Well, this is an idea of mine. This weird-looking thing is what I call a soundproof box. Mm -hmm. We just slip it over the camera, put another box over the motor, join the whole lot up with cables, and take them back to the soundproof room back of the set. And well, there it is. <laughs> yeah, John, but uh, what does it mean? Harry, it means you can move your camera anywhere you like. And that old microphone isn't going to pick up any sound whatsoever. All you have to do is to keep moving your camera and your microphone. And your actors can go any place and do anything you want them to do. How does that suit you? John Arnold, if this works, you'll get an Oscar. Okay, let's try it. Uh, Charlie! John Arnold here has got an idea we're going to try out. Now, uh, how about you running through Broadway Melody again, but this time don't stand still. Sell your song. Move around if you want to. Okay, Harry, that sounds well. My class, let's get going. Don't bring a frown to old Broadway. You've got a clown on Broadway. Your troubles there are out of style. For Broadway always wears a smile. A million lights, they flicker there. A million hearts beat quicker there. No skies of gray on the great wide way. That's the Broadway melody. Clown on Broadway, your troubles there, they're out of style, for Broadway always wears a smile. A million lights, they flicker there, a million hearts, they beat quicker there. No skies of gray on the great wide way, that's the Broadway melody. And so it worked, perfectly. MGM's engineering wizard, John Arnold, had set the camera free. His soundproof bungalow, as it was called, overnight revolutionized movie making in Hollywood. And as Harry Beaumont predicted, he got his Academy Award for it. And so concludes episode two of the MGM story. We trust you have enjoyed this recreation of a historic moment in motion picture history. And our thanks go to John O'Malley and Brian James in the roles of Harry Beaumont and John Arnold, and to Ross Higgins, who appeared by courtesy of Macquarie Network. Our pianist was Clyde Collins. It's a fact. True stories of the odd and the unusual. In France, rabbits have always been an important institution. Every year, nearly two million Frenchmen have paid the government over three and a half million pounds for licenses to hunt rabbits, and the annual kill was 20 million. 80% of the shotgun cartridges made in France were used on rabbits, and the industry employed thousands. Every peasant kept a hutch of domesticated rabbits, which he killed and ate thereby eking out his meager income and providing his family with meat they would otherwise never see. The rabbit was important to France, but not to Paul Armand de Lille.
a retired doctor and keen gardener and farmer. He spoke to his head gardener about it. Look here, Charles. The rabbits have been in and eaten every one of the seedlings we planted yesterday. But they couldn't get here. I put the rabbit foot fence around this plot myself. Well, they got in somehow. Look at these plants, a ruin. Chewed right down to the roots. I won't stand for it. But what can you do about it, Doctor? Well, I read in a magazine recently where the Australian government has practically wiped out rabbits by using a new virus called myxomatosis. I read about that too, Doctor, but uh, you mightn't it get out of hand. Of course not. All we'll do is infect a few rabbits on my own property. Once they die and kill their neighbors, the disease will disappear. Dr. Delisle obtained some of the myxomatosis virus from Switzerland. Two young rabbits were injected with it and released. Within a short while, the rabbit population on the farm had been practically wiped out, and the doctor was jubilant. But... One day, the head gardener brought him disturbing news. I've just come through the woods, Doctor. There are dead rabbits lying everywhere. In the woods? But that's well outside our boundary. Yes, I know. And when I was in town, I heard a man complaining that his caged rabbits were dying of some new disease. Caged rabbits? But there are different types from the wild ones. It does not seem to make much difference. But that's serious. If this gets out of hand, there'll be trouble. If you ask me, there is trouble now. It's gone too far to stop. Looks as though we've bitten off more than we can chew. Within a few months, the disease was raging throughout the country and had crossed into Belgium and Germany. Untold millions of rabbits, both wild and domesticated, died. Today, the rabbit population of France is practically nil. Thousands of men have lost jobs in ammunition factories. Thousands of peasants are going hungry, and the national economy has suffered a severe blow. All because one man wanted to save his seedlings. Incredible, but it's a fact. This is a true story taken from an actual medical file. Hello, Department of Health. I want the Bureau of Preventable Diseases, Willard Parker Hospital calling. Medical file. The story of the men and women whose vigilance guards our lives. A reconstruction of a clinical case history, step by step with the doctors who were there. Your name is John Clifford. You're a doctor of medicine, New York Department of Health, Bureau of Preventable Diseases. A killer is loose in the city. Your task, find it. Stamp it out before people start to die. New York is a city of eight million people. Each year, 100,000 children are born here. Each year, 80,000 people die from sickness or accident from homicide or old age. At the Department of Health, my job is to keep that death rate down, to make sure nothing like the events of February, March, 1947 ever happen again. It didn't begin here in New York. It began aboard a bus from Mexico City, noon, February 23rd, 1947. Another 30 minutes, Frank, that's all. A half hour and we'll be home. Maybe once I get off this bus, I'll have a break from these dizzy spells. I, I've never felt so bad. We'll get you straight to a hotel, darling, and oh, I'll call yeah, the doctor. There we were, you see, the president of the company one side, me the other, and I said to him, Mr. Holloway, I said, if you want sales, then Floyd Langram will get you sales. Gosh! <laughs> I sold him on the deal there. And, uh, 12 10, February 23rd. Approaching the end of a long journey through the southern states and across the Rio Grande from Mexico City. A mixed cross-section of passengers. A businessman and his wife returning home after ten years in Mexico. A florid salesman telling his life story. A honeymoon couple and sundry other tourists. A remote, transient world of people traveling together on the highway to New York. February 23rd, 12.45 p.m. 
In an anteroom at the bus terminal, Dr. Roger Marshall, a medical practitioner of New York City, was called and made a routine examination of Frank Lawrence, passenger from Mexico City. He prescribed rest, light diet, and promised to call the next day at the hotel in Midtown Manhattan where the Lawrences had a reservation. February 24th, 9.30 a.m. There you are, Mrs. Lawrence. Have these tablets made up as soon as you can. Yes, Doctor. I'll call back tomorrow and see how he is. What's wrong with him, Doctor? What, what's causing this fever and the rash all over his body? Oh, it's some kind of skin infection. If the tablets don't bring any relief, we may have to move him to hospital and take some tests. Hospital? Oh, well, don't you worry about that at the moment. We'll see how he is tomorrow morning. February 25th, 9.45 a.m. Dr. Marshall saw the patient for the third time. February 25th to February 27th. Frank Lawrence underwent a variety of tests at Bellevue's Dermatological Clinic. Results indeterminate. General diagnosis, acute skin poisoning, some signs of bronchial pneumonia. Decision? We're transferring your husband to Willard Parker Hospital, Mrs. Lawrence. He can get the kind of specialized attention that he needs there. He's going to be all right, isn't he, Doctor? Well, we hope so. Ten years we talked about coming home. Ten years we planned how it was going to be. He never even got to see all the places we talked about seeing again. Oh, Mrs. Lawrence, they'll do their best for him. Ten years, Doctor. And it had to be like this. February 27th. Patient transferred to Willard Parker Hospital. For the next three days, he ran a high fever placed on dangerously ill list. March 3rd, 8 a.m., fever vanished. The patient seemed much improved. Dr. Marshall. Doctor, this is Sister Lamar. Can you come to the fourth floor right away? What is it, Sister? An emergency? Yes, room 407. 407? But that's... It's Mr. Lawrence. Doctor, I can't rouse him. I, I think he's dead. Willard Parker Hospital, March 3rd, 1947. A routine report. Patient's name, Frank Arnold Lawrence. Died March 3rd. Cause of death? Bronchial pneumonia. Cause of death, bronchial pneumonia. At the time, it looked right. Lawrence had had bronchial pneumonia when he died. But three weeks proved the diagnosis wrong. Three weeks, the afternoon of March 24th. At the New York Health Department, I had a phone call that turned the Lawrence case from an obscure medical file into national headlines. <laughs> 2 p.m. I was in my office when the telephone rang. The caller was Dr. Janet Webster of Willard Parker Hospital on East 50th Street. Dr. Clifford? Speaking, doctor, what's trouble? I don't know if it is trouble yet, but it looks rather like it. We admitted two patients yesterday, suspected chickenpox cases. Yes? Well, during the night, both showed symptoms of chill, fever, and nausea, and the rashes are very clear. Mm, doesn't sound much like... Like anything as simple as chickenpox. No, I agree. We've changed diagnosis from malaria to scarlet fever to ulcerative endocarditis. But in my opinion, what we've got here is none of those three. Well, what do you think it is, Doctor? Smallpox. <laughs> This is Henry Simon, bringing you another story from my files here at the Missing Persons Bureau. In these stories of the Missing Persons Bureau, dramatized for Henry Simon by Ross Napier, names and addresses have, for obvious reasons, been changed. In one moment, the search for Franz Buller, address unknown. Masters had no idea how long he'd been in the water. The last thing he remembered was the fleeting sensation of being hurled through the air. 
a sharp jerk as his parachute had opened. Then darkness. He had no feeling in his legs, and his right arm was numb from the elbow down. The water was cold. If he wasn't fished out soon, certainly before nightfall, it was curtains. He felt no pain, fortunately. His vision was blurred, and there was a throbbing in his head. But his mind was as clear as a bell. He wished it wasn't. He wished he'd never regained consciousness. It would all have been so much simpler. Simpler still if he hadn't been wearing a life jacket, or his parachute hadn't opened. Suddenly he felt an overwhelming weariness. His eyes closed and he no longer cared. If this was death, then death was sweet. Goodbye, sea. Goodbye, sky. Peace. Blessed oblivion. Gar nicht gut aus. Da, versuch mal ein bisschen von dem. Trink. Guter Junge. Nur schön ruhig jetzt. Besser? Who the place is you? My name is Franz Buller. You're a... Yes, I'm a German. But do not worry. I bear no grudge against you. Uh, no, no, I... no, lie still. You are too weak to sit up. Uh, oh. Where? Where are we? We are in the North Sea. To the east is the Danish coast. About 50 miles away, I would estimate. If luck is with us, we will be picked up by noon tomorrow. That is, luck will be with one of us. The other will be a prisoner of war. Masters could just make out the whiteness of his rescuer's teeth. They appeared to be on some form of raft, but he was too dazed to be certain. Again, consciousness deserted him. When next his eyes opened, the sun was high. He could feel its warmth upon his face. Raising his head, he looked about him. The raft was about ten feet square, something of the type he'd seen lashed to the decks of Scandinavian fishing boats. And sitting beside him was a man who was clad only in shorts with long, fair hair and a lean, brown body, his bare feet dangling in the water. Good morning, all men. You sleep well, yeah? How, how long have we been on this thing? Since yesterday. Now it is tomorrow. I pulled you from the water just in time, I think. At first, I'm sure you're dead. I'm about to throw you back again. Then you are opening your eyes and knowing that you're alive. Well, you shot down too? Nine. The ship I'm on, she sunk by torpedoes from the air. The small oil tanker. There is no one else to be saved. My comrades, they are all dead, I think. Uh, you're a fighter pilot, yeah? I was a fighter pilot. You choose a bad spot to jump out. The water is very cold. Oh, I, I needed the exercise. <laughs> it is good to see you have not lost your sense of humor. Yours doesn't seem to have suffered much damage either. Perhaps I needed the exercise too. Ah, oh, she is a crazy business, this war. Oh, I, I'd give something to know what's wrong with my legs. I can't move them. My right arm's gone on me, too. Help will come soon. I, I feel it. Your side of mine. Who knows? Well, what's the idea of leaving your feet in the water? Are you trying to feed them solid or something? It's to clot the blood. But I cut my feet. It's, it's nothing. They've been bleeding all this time. They stop. They start again. You see? Yeah, you, you need a doctor pretty badly yourself. I will live. It's a glorious day, huh? Yeah? Yeah, it could be worse. Oh, oh, oh. I'm afraid I'm not in much of a mood. To... Wait. Oh, what is it? Do I not hear a plane? Yeah, look! Uh, can you make it out? It's a Junkers. Oh, just my luck. He has seen us. He's flying over. Did I not tell you help would come? No, nope, the wrong kind. Oh, wrong for you. But be of good heart, my friend. You will be well taken care of. 
and the war, she will not last long. Already we have won. It's just that you stubborn British refuse to realize it. Some hours later, the two men were picked up by a German patrol boat and conveyed to the port of Esbjerg on the Danish coast. There, Masters was formally taken into custody and duly transported to a prison camp near Bremen, where he spent several months in hospital, gradually regaining the use of his paralyzed limbs, which had been very badly jarred, but had suffered no serious injury. On his recovery, he was transferred to Stahleg Luft 7 in Wiesbaden, and there spent the remaining three years of the war. For the Missing Persons Bureau, this case had its beginning in the October of 1947, when I was visited here in my office by Masters himself, who recounted the story of his rescue and subsequent survival, stating that he was very anxious to locate the man who had saved his life. I can't tell you much about him, Mr. Simon, except that he was a German sailor, possibly attached to the merchant service. And his name was Franz Buller? Well, that's what he said. Why is it you want him traced exactly? Well, for one thing, he's responsible for my being alive today, and for another, he made my stay in the prison camp a good deal easier than it might have been. Oh? In what way? Well, every six weeks or so, without a miss, he sent me a food parcel. Or if he didn't send it himself, he had someone send it for me. To the prison camp? Ah, uh, yes. This went on for the whole three years you were there? Until about six months before the end. Huh. Did he accompany the parcels with a letter? No, sometimes he'd write a few words in a card, such as um, chin up or hope you're getting on all right, but usually there was just a parcel. Oh, very odd. The only explanation I can think of is that uh, having saved my life, he must have felt in some way responsible for my well-being. No Lord knows why. I wasn't particularly gracious to him. For that matter, I don't even remember saying thanks. After the patrol boat picked us up, I didn't have much opportunity. And when we docked in Esbjerg, there was a truck waiting to collect him. I saw him shaking hands with some army officer. He jumped on, threw me away, and that's the last I saw of him. You're quite sure he was a sailor? Well, he definitely gave me that impression. Certainly he was on the ship that was sunk. He'd hardly have been floating about in the North Sea on a raft for, well, for exercise. What age would he have been? No, about 30. A very fine-looking chap, tall, blonde hair, Prussian, I'd say. Hmm. Do you merely wish to thank him for what he did, or have you something more, more tangible in mind? Well, uh, some of these fellows got a pretty raw deal after the surrender. Strikes me the least I can do is see how he's making out. Perhaps put in a good word for him, give him a helping hand. Well, assuming he's still alive, that is. Quite. He didn't tell you anything at all about himself, I suppose? Unfortunately, no. You mentioned something about his feet being rather badly cut about. Oh, yes. They, they were deeply gashed in the line above the toes, as if he'd caught them on something sharp. He'd lost a fair whack of blood, but it didn't seem to bother him. He was full of beans the whole time. He wasn't wearing any sort of uniform? No, just a pair of dark grey shorts. Was he an educated man? Oh, oh, yes, I'd say so. He spoke English very well for a German. You made no inquiries yourself, I take it. Well, no. I wouldn't know where to start. I think military intelligence might be about the best bet. If you'll just let me have a few more routine particulars, I'll give them a ring right away. Inga Stratton was tall and blonde, unusually attractive, with large blue eyes and well-shaped Nordic features. She received the agent cordially readily identifying herself as the sister of our quarry. You have me curious, Mr. Hunter. What is your business with France? Or is that a question you'd rather not answer? Oh, no, that's quite uh, simple. Uh, during the war, he saved the life of a British flyer. He was... Oh, uh, not the one who was taken prisoner? Yeah, that's right. Now, Masters. Alan Masters, mm. yes. Mm. Oh, you knew about him? Uh, France told me. Ah, I see. Well, uh, this... Uh, Alan Masters, now, he wants Franz located. You know, kind of thank him, maybe repay him in some way. Oh, but how very kind of him. Oh, yes, he feels it's the least thing can do. And apart from saving his life, your brother sent him food packages regularly the whole time he was in the prison camp. He did receive them, then? Oh, yeah, yeah, he got them all right. Uh, I had no way of knowing for sure. You see, Mr. Hunter, it was I who sent them. Uh, well, what do you mean it was you who sent them? Well, Franz wrote and asked me if I would. Oh. At the time, I had a good job, and I was able to obtain as much food as I wanted. 
Well, wait a minute. Some of the parcels had, had notes in them, signed by him. Yeah, no, no. Signed by me on his behalf. I see. Well, whichever one of you sent them, it was certainly a swell gesture and was greatly appreciated. I'm glad. Yeah, uh, one thing that kind of puzzles me, uh, how your brother came to be drifting about the North Sea in a raft. He was a U-boat commander, wasn't he? Uh, the U-boat was sunk. He and some of his men were rescued by a German oil tanker. Mm -hmm. A few hours later, the tanker itself was sunk. France was washed overboard in the initial blast. And uh, a few minutes later, the whole vessel exploded. He was the sole survivor. Mm. Well, where did this um, raft come from? Oh, there were four of them lashed to the decks for emergencies. One of them must have come loose. Mm. Franz said he was in the water for hours before he saw it floating quite close to him. It was not long after that he picked up Alan Masters. I see. On his return to Germany, he was transferred to shore duty. His feet had been injured. He was unable to walk properly again. So they gave him a job as instructor at the naval school at Schleswig. Where he remained for the rest of the war? Almost. A few months before the end, the school was badly damaged in an air raid. A large section of it was wiped out. Yeah? We searched the ruins for his body, but no trace was ever found. And here again is Henry Simon. Ingo Stratton's information was later verified by military intelligence. Although his death had never been officially recorded, presumably because of the chaos that ensued, Franz Buller had met his end when the naval school at Schleswig was bombed, just a few months before the German capitulation. His body had never been recovered, but there can be no doubt whatever of his fate. Twice he'd escaped death by a hair's breadth. The third time, his luck had run out. And now, as always, this is Henry Simon inviting you to meet me here again. And for the present, bidding you not goodbye, but simply au revoir. <laughs> Adventures of the Falcon. Hello. This is the Falcon speaking. Eh? Oh, Lois. I'm afraid you'll have to excuse me from our date tonight, Angel. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to be busy on a case. Yes. I've got to prove that the deaf can sometimes be blind to murder. Once again, we bring you the gay, exciting Adventures of the Falcon, starring George Randall. The Falcon, as you know, is Michael Waring, freelance detective who's always ready with a hand for oppressed men and an eye for oppressed women. So join him for tonight's complete adventure when the Falcon learns fate has a strange voice. Twenty-four hours have passed since the murder of Fred Barr. And now at Mike Waring's apartment. Yes? I'm looking for a Michael Waring. Oh, then you've come to the right place. Are you... Oh, that's right. My name is Emily Barr. Oh, come in. I'm terribly sorry, Mrs. Barr. Sorry? About what? Your loss. How would you know about that? Well, very few people wear widow's weeds from choice. Mr. Waring, I'll come right to the point. My husband was killed yesterday. Killed? What do you mean? An accident or murder? Murdered. And I'm afraid the police think I did it. Hmm. Let's have the gory details. He was found with his head crushed in, in our room at the residential we own. All the money in the house was gone. Do you think the motive was robbery? I don't know. Anybody in our house could have done it. There's this girl, Jane. She found him. Who's Jane? I don't know. She just moved in. Claims she's the daughter of an old professional beggar who has a room in our place. I don't know anything about her except that... Uh, except what? Nothing. Do you always stop in the middle of a phrase, or don't you like Jane? I don't like or dislike her. Did you get on well with your deceased husband? We got along very well. Did you love him? 
course I loved him. I was terribly devoted to him. Uh, it seems to me you're not the type who'd ever be devoted to anyone. What you really want is for me to prove you didn't do it. If I killed Fred, would I hire a private detective? You might, very possibly. You understand, Mrs. Barr, this is going to cost you money. How much? Well, that all depends on what I'm getting myself into. So before I give you an estimate, suppose I take a look at your boarding house first. Only me, Mr. Primrose, and this is Mr. Waring. He wanted to meet you. Hello, Mr. Primrose. You're a detective, aren't you? <laughs> yes, and you're a professional beggar. Uh, you can take those dark glasses off. You're not blind. Uh, look here. You really live the part, don't you? Is that hearing aid part of your act, too? No, he's really deaf, Mr. Waring. He can't hear a thing without that gadget. But that's the truth. You're a great one to talk about truth. What do you know about Fred Barr's murder? Not a thing. You certain? Well, if I were you, I'd have a talk with Tom Ryder. I'm going to in a few minutes. But what made you suggest him? I'll tell you something when we're alone. Uh, you mind, Mrs. Barr? Now, look, Mr. Waring. No need to be offended. Mr. Primrose obviously has something for my shell-like ears alone. And if you want the murderer of your husband caught... Never mind the explanations. She did it, Mr. Waring. I know she did. Why do you say that? Well, she was real mean to Freddy. Treated him like dirt. You know what I think? She and this Tom Ryder planned this thing together. Why? Well, she and this Ryder were... Oh, come in, Jane. Am I interrupting anything? No. Mr. Weary, this is my daughter, Jane. How do you do? How do you do? He's investigating Fred Barr's murder, Jane. Oh, really? Really. Have you found any clues yet? Well, one or two, but I'm still looking for a few more. Mind if I took a look in the cellar? The cellar? Why do you want to look down there? I'm looking for a blunt metallic object of considerable weight used for the purpose of collapsing the skull of Fred Barr, ending his life. But it's uh, awfully dirty down there. I don't mind. Mm, well, go ahead if you want to. Who's to stop you? Funny you should ask that, Mrs. Barr, because I was under the impression that's exactly what you were trying to do. <laughs> Certainly is gloomy down here. I wonder why Emily didn't want me to... Who's there? I saw you, my friend. Come on out. If you're out by the time I count three... Don't shoot. Who are you? Tom Ryder. What are you doing in the cellar, Ryder? I'm... I'm looking for my trunk. Did you expect to find it behind the furnace? Who are you? Mike Waring. You're the detective Emily Hyde. That's right. Well, I've got some important information for you. Uh, everybody around here has. What's that? No, it'll keep. Just tell me who's your nomination for the murder of Fred... What's the matter? See the pipe on the lid? Where? Hidden behind those empty cans. Funny place for a pipe to be. What's funny about it? You're right, Ryder. It's not funny. Because there's a red stain on it that looks suspiciously like... A light. Someone put out the light. Well, where's the switch? It's right over by the... Oh! Ryder! Ryder! What happened to... Oh! Oh! Get up. Oh, oh, my head. What happened? You were knocked on the head. Who, who did it? I don't know. What are you doing down here, Mrs. Barr? Well, when you didn't come back upstairs after an hour, I came down to the cellar to look for you. Did you find me? Don't be so funny. You were knocked out cold. I thought you were dead. That's a very ugly possibility. Let's not think about it. Where's Ryder? Was he down here? Yes. Well, he's not here now. That's very strange. And just when he was about to give me some important information. Oh, he's a bit touched in the head, the old fool. He doesn't know anything. Where is he? How should I know? Well, look up there. I don't see anything. That's just the trouble. Before I was tapped on the head, there was a brass pipe on that lid. I don't understand. It was the murder weapon. How do you know that? I looked into my crystal ball. Also, my crystal ball tells me that the person most likely to think about pipes is the landlady of this house. Look here, Mr. Waring. I didn't kill Fred. You did your best to try to keep me from coming down here. I just didn't want you wasting your time. The police had already looked. Then how do you suppose they overlooked it? Look here, Waring. Can't we discuss... Oh, no. What's wrong now? Look over there, in the corner. It's Ryder. What's wrong with him? 
Well, Mrs. Barr, to name one thing, he's dead. 